In this episode of Cube FM, got a chance to speak to both Miguel and Tybalt, who work in a company called Adavinta. They were involved in the project of building an internal developer platform called Ship. And on top of that, switching from ADM to ARM, not necessarily the easiest task, involves a fair amount of planning, making sure that stakeholders' needs are being met, and as always, balancing the technical with the human side. Oftentimes, we may be speaking about technologies, but at the same time, a lot of it's about change management and making sure that everyone's interests are being taken into consideration to make clear and balanced decisions. That being said, before we get into the episode, we'd like to say thanks to our sponsor, Learn K Eats. For those of you out there who are trying to level up in your Kubernetes journey, in your career, knowledge, and expertise, you can check out the courses on learnk8s.io, in which you will see different things that you can learn about Kubernetes in an environment where it's 60% practical, 40% theoretical, instructor-led courses that are available in groups, as well as private forms of instruction. You'll have access to all the material for the rest of your lives, so you can squeeze all that wonderful knowledge and improve your skills. So like I said, check out learnk8s.io for more information about the online, in-person courses that are offered there. Now, let's get to the episode. So as always, um, our first question, it'd be interesting to see the comparing and contrasting between the two of you. If you had a brand new Kubernetes cluster and had to install three tools, which three would they be? Let's start with you, Miguel. So I might, my question, I think it's a bit boring. It's the typical things. One of the first things is cert manager because uh, otherwise it, it's a, it's a great way to get certificates in your cluster. Another one is Prometheus operator. I'm very partial to Prometheus most of the time. I want to try new things, but so far Prometheus has been true and tested. And uh, Kida for auto scaling based on several metrics. That would be my go-to first thing in a, in a new cluster. Very good to hear that. We add the Keta maintainer, uh, Jorge, on as uh, in one of our previous podcasts. He'll be very happy to know that uh, for Kubernetes event-driven auto-scaling. Tim, what about you? Which three tools would you install? Okay, so for me, it would be the first one would be Argo CD uh, because I do everything GitOps. Um, and then I would go for Cilium because eBPF. And then I would go for traffic. But obviously, we're super complementary, right? Because everything that Miguel said, I would also install it. Okay, good. All right, but nice to hear different perspectives. Tibalt, I just want to ask really quickly, since you mentioned Argo, have you tried Flux? And if so, what are the things that you find in Argo that, that give you an extra edge that you wouldn't have with Flux? I didn't try Flux per se. Uh, so I, I don't know exactly the experience with, uh, with Flux, but it's the one that we're experienced with and you know I'm feeling comfortable with. Makes sense. Just like what Miguel said regarding uh, Prometheus. Like you know, we say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Good. Now, quick introduction for the two of you. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about what you do and where you work? Uh, Miguel, we'll start with you. Yeah, so we both work together, same team, in Adivinta. Adivinta is a, a classified, a bunch of classified marketplaces, mostly based in Europe. And uh, what we do is that we work in the common platform runtime team which is uh, tasked with providing a Kubernetes as a service uh, platform for all the workloads or most of the workloads in the company. And Tibal, anything you want to add in terms of what your role is? Yeah, so basically I'm supposedly the product owner of the team, right? So uh, that means uh, dealing with understanding uh, what are the customer needs, our users' needs. Uh, our users they are basically the developers of the company, but also some platform team that specializes uh, part of uh, of the integrations uh, to their developers. So we have like different uh, different kind of users, understanding what are their their needs, what are their pain points, what we can do to uh, to improve uh, their daily life, and trying to translate it into uh, what we can uh, achieve and, and goals that we set to ourselves. Fantastic. With that in mind, you know the two of you are at this point in your career. What were you doing before cloud native? How what was the process of of getting into these technologies? So for me, it was a change of company, actually. Uh, so I was working before um, in high-performance computing with data centers and the, the whole thing. And then I moved to a company that was uh, had everything in AWS. It was not really cloud-native, but everything was already in, in AWS. And we had needs to deploy faster, to get more reliability, get better scalability. So 
we iterated uh, time and again and ended up in a cloud native approach. Oh, I have a very different background. So I used to be an embedded uh, C developer, right? Uh, so the big word, C. And uh, because of C, I was offered to move to uh, data centers uh, to join basically Adevinta through Le Bon Coin, which is the French uh, subsidiary. And from there, I was the backend developer, was, I was a backend developer in, uh, in Le Bon Coin. And overall, I, bit by bit, I was interested in the infrastructure, how it was working and what's on. Uh, I started to debug Jenkins uh, with, uh, with Docker and we virtualized, isolated the environments. And this is how it started. And it ended up uh, basically in the, in the runtime team uh, doing Kubernetes. Okay. With that in mind too, you know, with uh, we we often find ourselves in these situations for for different reasons. In terms of your experience, your learning journey with Kubernetes, what are the resources that that have been most helpful? Blogs, videos, documentation. Tim, what what works best for you? Yeah. So basically, usually I follow uh, several uh, people and and threads in um, on the social networks, right? So basically, uh, LinkedIn and and X, or previously Twitter. And uh, learn Kubernetes uh, is one of them, um, obviously. And basically, this helps me stick with uh, and keep up to date with uh, with what we have in the in the landscape, right? Also, uh, filtering and, and searching on Google and GitHub about very specific specific needs that we need to uh, that that we have at at a given point in time. This helps me basically understand the landscape and and being up to date. So. A bit of passive where I filter uh, on and and and, and I'd get some info, some newest information, but also some active uh, based on uh, on needs, right? So actual things that we need to do. Fantastic, Miguel. What's your approach? Uh, it's quite similar, but I don't use X, for example. Uh, so I tend to look for blocks. I also look at the KubeCon rosters, the list of talks, and pick up. Uh, titles that seem interesting or the people that I know the, the name from the community that they are prob probably going to tell me something very interesting about it. I follow the last week in Kubernetes development newsletter as well to be up to date to the most recent things. And uh, if I have to search for specific things, documentation and the GitHub issues mostly <laughs> to find to find places to, to go. All those sounds like, yeah, good combination of best practices. Knowing all these things, if there's anything that you could, you know, advice you could give your previous selves uh, in terms of career advice about things that would help you level up or things that would be better to focus your time on, what would you say, you know, Tibalt, in your experience previously as, as, as a C developer, what, what, are, what are things that you would say like, you know what, if I could go back, I might, I might have done this differently? Well, take it easy first, right? Um, so life is long. And, and you don't have to to sprint uh, on everything that you that you do, and it's not all about tech, right? It's uh, there are there are many things apart from uh, from tech that uh, that you need to be in, and if you take it easy, you will uh, you will realize it, and um, and you will uh, basically enjoy it more. Really good advice. I love that, Miguel. What about you? Well, I I agree, but for me, it's uh, take it. It's there's so many more things than tech uh, in it that it doesn't matter that you are not in tech because I was not trained in tech. I'm a chemical engineer from training. And uh, it's uh, also don't undersell yourself. You can learn these things. You can um, get into, into, these, into these things. Take it easy and look at the foundations, Good foundations and especially network. Find someone that is already in that has much more experience than you and that can help you to find your gaps. I love that. I have really, really good advice. I must say, like we ask this question to all of our guests, and this is by far the best response we've ever got. <laughs> so this one, this like like well, like I said for recording purposes, this will be used as a separate clip. I, we could do an entire episode just about that. Um, also coming with different from different backgrounds. Um, I my background is completely non technical. And, and so, yeah, I, I very much agree with the network, you know, the networking, you know, finding people that are more advanced than you, taking it easy. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, some of these things cannot be learned in, you know, two weeks, no matter what people try to sell you. Um, so it's very, very good advice. Cool. 
Now we're going to be getting into the to the main topic, all right? So we found, you know, in terms of our content discovery efforts, we found this article um, about transparently providing um, ARM nodes to 4,000 engineers. So at your company, um, you're part of the team that's maintaining uh, SHIP, S-C-H-I-P, uh, an internal developer platform. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, sure. So SHIP is basically, it's part of a bigger platform, uh, the actual internal developer platform uh, that uh, we name Common Platform, that gives the name to the to the, uh, to the the team, right? Common Platform Runtime that, uh, that Miguel uh, um, mentioned, right? And basically the goal of the Common Platform is to uh, provide a fully integrated experience to our developers. So it's easy to develop and, and ship code um, to production, right? So... They can focus on uh, the business goals that they have, and they don't have to worry about the internals about Kubernetes per se, for example. So they uh, they speed up their, their experience there. About this, uh, we have uh, our, our former colleague uh, Gallo, who wrote a blog post right? that is uh, super interesting. It's uh, how to build a path for uh, 1,500 uh, engineers. right? This was uh, three or four years ago already. And we scale a little bit more than that now, uh, so uh, it's still good, uh, good things, and there are still the, the roots of of this uh, blog post is still inside the, the DNA of of Ship. Um, so we focus basically the the platform. We focus on on gluing things together, and uh, we provide a golden path so that it's easy to do things, but also the what we call the escape hatches, where uh, basically you can go your own way if the provided a fully abstracted, fully uh, golden uh, path doesn't work for you, right? So think about it like the highway. On the highway, you can get the highway. I'm currently based in Barcelona and I often go to Paris. I can take the highway from Barcelona to Paris. It's super easy. But if I need uh, to go for a pit stop, I can take get away from the highway and that's not a problem. The highway, I can take it a bit, uh, a bit farther. Yet, I benefit from most of the highway, right? So this is a bit uh, what we are um, uh, what we are uh, focusing on, right? Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Uh, just to take it a little bit further, though, you know, like uh, for companies that are out there understanding, you know, the steps that have to be taken, investing in in a project like this. What what how has that process been like? You know, getting participation, stakeholder alignment. What how, what's that been like? How has that? What's your experience been there? It's been a long, a, a long journey, right? Uh, so it all started. Um, so it was 2016. So that's uh, that's almost nine years ago, right? Um, and basically, by then, we are, we had a team that was maintaining a platform for uh, machine learning jobs uh, that was running on top of Mesos, and they saw that basically there was a rise of um, of needs for of people using Kubernetes. Right, using Kubernetes for production, and the same thing happens. Right, it's okay. Why, why people are are running their own Kubernetes on their side? It's like duplicated effort, right? So, on one side, it's good because they can do exactly what they need, right? And this was the the focus of the company at that time. But at the same time, uh, the effort is duplicated, right? And this is uh, this is something that we we aimed at at solving uh, back in uh, in that time, and we started basically uh, this ship project um, to uh, to address those needs, right? Um, and it's only two years later that we actually uh, started to uh, start the common platform. So we started the common platform two years later with the idea of gluing things that were already existing. So we had uh, Kubernetes, so ship. We had uh, other pieces like CI, CD, but nothing was really integrated. It was like pieces of infrastructure of, of software that you or tools that you could use on their own, but nothing really coherent across them. We started uh, basically gluing things together with an ID, which was the common platform ID. And from there, we started to have one specific marketplace that we wanted to onboard and that, that was willing to onboard basically a mutual thing. That was Italy. So our marketplace, our, our colleagues in Italy, they started to onboard this. And this was the, the start of the journey towards the modern uh, ship, right? Uh, what, what ship is today. We onboarded them. It took us uh, about a year to onboard completely uh, this marketplace. Right, so we had a lot of uh, rough edges, uh, things that were 
not as polished as we would like, but yet uh, we made it in one year, uh, one or two years. Um, and then around uh, 2019, 2018, 2019, I would say, uh, we onboarded another marketplace, the Spanish marketplace, right? And there uh, we finally, we, we migrated. It's a bigger marketplace than, uh, than the, the, the Italian one. More uh, brands as well. So we had, uh, they'll have more sites, more, uh, more team uh, members. We onboarded them in about a year. In about a year, we migrated most of their workload, right? At the same time, uh, we had to do some upgrades. Right, and we were at the beginning. EKS was not a thing uh, or not usable uh, for us, so we went into 2016. Right, uh, we went for uh, QBA AWS, which was the best way to deploy Kubernetes uh, on the, on Amazon for us at this point in time. But for this, the, the in-place upgrade was not an option. Right, so we had we had projects to migrate, and this took us like with five customers. It took us quarters. To, to migrate, a lot of synchronization and what's on, to upgrade to new to a newer Kubernetes version. So we also started at the same time that we were scaling, we started this process of being able to upgrade basically uh, all, our, all our customers. And at the same time, Kubernetes AWS got deprecated and they, they actually completely stopped the development of Kubernetes AWS. So we looked for a solution and this solution was actually EKS. Right, so we migrated to EKS as an as an upgrade. It took us with probably five times the number of customers that we had. Uh, it took us even not a quarter uh, or maybe a bit more, right? But it it took us roughly the same time, but with more uh, more people uh, on board it, right, to migrate completely to uh, to EKS and less less noise, right, as well. And that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much it. Right now, we are uh, running uh, around thirty clusters. We are running in four regions. So we're, from what we started, uh, one cluster, one region, one Kubernetes version, no upgrade. And we are we are now running in uh, four regions, um, several clusters, like around thirty clusters, and we provide in place upgrades uh, that. Also requires a certain number of tooling, but this could be probably uh, the topic of uh, of a future podcast. Okay, <laughs> good. It would be wonderful to continue the conversation. Now, you mentioned you know cost savings as being one of the reasons why Ship is such a successful project. From things that we've seen talking to other folks in the ecosystem, a lot of times co cost can be associated uh, with computing workloads like EC2. Is that also the case for Adavinta? Miguel, do you want to take that? Yeah. So uh, in our case, for our platform, as Kibo was saying, we have about 30 clusters. That's uh, thousands of nodes. And uh, that means that we have a lot of machines running. And they tend to be beefy machines because we pack a lot of workloads into the same machine. And that, that makes a quite a hefty bill. So one of the, we are always looking into ways that we can optimize costs and reduce uh, the cost other than just uh, having a single platform instead of repeated platforms for every team. And one of the things that we noticed, uh, and we think it's also a trend in the industry right now, is the move to ARM-based uh, instances, because these instances are cheaper. And that's one of the projects that we tried to do to save cost was to uh, try to make it seamless for our users to start using the ARM nodes so they can so we can reduce the cost of the platform without uh, requiring developer developer involvement in that in that migration with that in mind, it's, is it as simple as, you know, flipping a switch or pressing a button and all the instances go from AMD to ARM and you just save tons of money, right? <laughs> well, it's 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 slightly more complicated. That's what uh, that's what our end goal is. That developers feel that's uh, like that. But before that, uh, there's a lot of uh, of movement we we have to do of, of uh, steps we have to prepare uh, beforehand. Uh, one of the problems is that most workloads are compiled or built somehow for specific uh, CPU architecture. ARM and AMD64 are completely different CPU architectures, so the, the binaries are not compatible. If you have a Java machine running for AMD, it doesn't work in ARM. 
So the first thing we have to do is to build uh, our pipelines or build pipelines where we co containerize the workloads. So they are multi-architecture and they are built all the time. So all workloads get built for AMD and ARM. Once we have them like that, we can, uh, at the moment of scheduling, select which version of the same Docker image we want, if the ARM or the AMD, depending on what hardware we have available at the moment. So we can start having hybrid clusters where some of the nodes are AMD, some of the nodes are ARM. And as more teams on board on these multi-architecture pipelines, the shift uh, between both architectures is completely transparent to the user and it only happens in the, in the runtime phase uh, of, the, of the execution. Okay, was, you know, from what you said previously, you know, the, the context of the different migrations you've been through, you know, we go as far back as talking about Mesos, which is a nice feel. We realized like, oh, wow, that was a long time ago. But in terms of planning a migration of this, you know, scale and complexity, what, how does that look like? You know, for, for people that might be thinking about something being in a similar process, what was that like in your case? So actually we optimize for reducing planning. Right, and this is the whole uh, the whole strategy that we have applied, and uh, this is what we wanted to explain also in in, say, in this blog post that we that we mentioned uh, before. Right, so we wanted to reduce planning because with that amount of developers, uh, this would mean synchronizing with every one of them, and this would have a super high cost. Right. At the same time, we wanted to have autonomy to be able to provide it to provide the opportunity for developers. Um, to actually optimize their cost and to uh, to split into uh, smaller pieces, right? If we go for a full migration, then yes, the first part that we need to do is to actually have all the images compatible with both, uh, to both architectures, right? We didn't go that path. We said, okay, we enable it. We will enable people to use ARM uh, images so that then it's easy for them and they can do it pretty transparently. One of the th one of the, the thing that we observed is that when you actually in standard uh, Kubernetes in the in the plain Kubernetes, when you want to actually go for a ARM, then you have you, you need to replace yourself, right? You need to say, okay, I need to build this image for AMD and the ARM, and I need to say to say my pod, please go to AMD or ARM. Right? This is what you actually do. So what we went for is a clean interface and a small interface. Don't repeat yourself, right? So if you say it in the in the image, then we will consider it. Super simple. So uh, we wanted to be conservative because we had a lot of uh, people running on top of our clusters. And from an experience that we had, an ex the, the, the experience that we had from other part of the company, we knew that sometimes for example, in Go, uh, on some version of the compiler and some version of, uh, of ARM, it can be that specific functions like cryptographic functions are slower in ARM than in AMD. And with this feedback from other parts of the business that was not on the platform at, at this point in time, went for, uh, for this, discovered this pain point. So we took this into consideration and we said, we will be conservative if you have both, and you didn't say anything, we will go for the legacy uh, behavior, right? And to be even further uh, conservative, we provide what we call good default, right? So that means that if the image is not a multi-architecture image, right? You didn't build it with the Docker manifest in this case. What we will do is that we will select the, the legacy behavior, right? So that means AMD. So all together, we provide something that is backward compatible, small interface, but yet we offer the, uh, the possibility for people to force uh, to force their uh, their architecture with a super simple uh, interface, which is a label. Why a label? Because uh, basically most of our users they are deploying through abstraction layers. And again, if we want to, uh, to optimize uh, for 
providing and for autonomy and providing this feature in, into production pretty quickly, that means that we would have to change the abstraction layers to actually include it. That means changing several hem charts, some uh, in-house uh, developed or shared, in this case it's shared with other uh, companies, uh, ab abstraction layers named FIAS in this case, right? That would we would need to agree so that slows down the whole process and what's on. And we wanted to just have the autonomy, keep it simple, ship it, and then observe uh, the result, right? That was the approach. So the, le the least planning possible, the less planning possible, but the safest possible, right? And then as an extra um, step of, of, uh, of care, what we did before actually going to production is to run several times some dry run, right? So because of the nature of Kubernetes that is descriptive, we can actually list everything that is being used in the clusters and understand how what we are currently uh, going to deploy, what we are going to release, is going to behave, right? And we say, okay, this is good for everything that is in the platform. We would select AMD. We can go for it, right? If we had cases where we would not be sure there would be errors, we would need to go for this process again and ensure that with what is in the platform currently, we select what is running. A lot of planning, but it sounds like, I feel like this, you, you, the two of you could easily write a book to, to help other organizations through these problems because they can be quite overwhelming. You mentioned an element of risk and also about being conservative. So asking every team to choose a node selector uh, to run their workloads sounds risky as they might forget to do it. You know, as much as we're talking about technologies or human error and people might forget, uh, what's your experience been like there? So yeah, it's it's very risky. It's it's risky in many ways because when they are trying to migrate, they may change the build of the image, but not change the node selector, or they may find a bug and they revert. And in that revert, they are reverting the the build, but they are not reverting the node selector. And now the pods don't start; they fail because they, it's in the wrong architecture. And then. You, it takes a while to figure out why is this new error and this delays the uh, release of fetches and, and stops the, the whole pipeline. So what, the, what we did is that we created a mutating webhook. So this mutating webhook uh, called Noi is installed in our clusters. And whenever a pod uh, gets in, it checks if a node selector is defined. It's defined, you know what you're doing or you should, so we will honor what you're doing. But if you don't specify an node selector, then we will inspect the image that you have provided. And depending on what the manifest of the image tells us, we will inject node selectors and node affinities according to the uh, architectures that you support. We will check all the containers that are running in your pod, including the startup containers, because maybe your startup container is only supporting one architecture, even if you build your the container for one, you may have sidecars like Datadog sidecar or some other observability sidecars, and those may not be ready to run in ARM or may not be ready to, to run in AMD for some reason. They were misbuilt. So we will check that everything uh, has a common architecture, and then we will select, uh, we will inject the node selectors and node affinities adequate so your pod can run. Because our, our most important guarantee is that your workload as a developer will run in the cluster, no matter the architecture. And then, uh, as Thibault was saying, to the risk, the migration, and for the initial phases, we select AMD by default. Our goal is to eventually be able to, to have so many teams onboarded, so many teams that have selected that they prefer and, and that's important. They prefer to use ARM instead of AMD, that they have overridden this setting so we can change the full behavior and stop being so conservative. Wow. One thing just to clarify, uh, you mentioned Noah. Is it open source? Yes, it's open source. It's on GitHub. And uh, we should be providing you with a link uh, Good. about it. All right, I cool. think so it's I... most linked already in the, in the blog post. Good, good, good. Yes, you're right. You're right. You're right. Just, but just so if, like, it's what's wonderful about these conversations is that 
it's not just hearing from somebody. Folks can go out directly and then use that and get that experience. You talk, you know, speaking about the webhook though. So the webhook was great for migrating regular deployments. What about daemon sets that run on every cluster? And you know, because they can't run on ARM nodes if they're built to run on AMD nodes. So what about that? Yeah, that's a that's a good point, right? Here we are lucky because we are the only ones uh, managing daemon sets, right? Our users they don't manage daemon sets because of the nature also of our platform, right? It doesn't really make sense for our users to uh, to run daemon sets. Uh, so we are the ones running daemon sets. So we had to actually do this work. Fortunately, after some trial, we realized that most of the community actually did go for uh, multi-architecture builds and actually way more than just ARM and AMD. Uh, many are using uh, fancy architectures from the from their own data that no way is, uh, is giving us, right? That's one. And, uh, and the second one is that we had some demand sets, actually two. I just got the numbers uh, to, uh, to check and, and I thought it was more than that. So actually two demand sets was, were not uh, compatible, were not multi-architecture. So for those ones, uh, what we did is to actually uh, build it and repackage it ourselves, right? So how do we repackage it ourselves? What we do is that, uh, or what we did, is that we didn't fork because then in the fork you need to to maintain, you need to update, you need to all of this, and then uh, you, you need to fetch, push. It's it's a complex uh, process. You you need to track the branches. What we did is to uh, to have patches, right? So we have a patch that enables multi-architecture build inside the Docker file of those forks. Fortunately, they are not of the forks of those uh, two daemon sets that are namely Kiam and, and Kubernetes in the version that we're using. They are not compatible with military architecture. And for those, we have a patch that we apply that just mutates the Docker file so that it works in a multi architecture uh, build, right? What we do in this is that what we did also discover is that the multi architecture build uh, from Docker, the, the plain uh, cross compile from Docker, an emulation from Docker is not as performant as what the Go cross compiling is providing us, right? So it was orders of magnitude, right? So the Go cross compile is order of magnitude uh, faster than a Docker emulation uh, build, right? So what we did is that we went for cross compiling at the Go level. So we have multi-stage uh, build basically, and we use the target platform and um, build platform, if I remember correctly, uh, argument right from the uh, from Docker that allows us basically to do uh, to do the, the the cross compile build efficiently, and then on the last stage we just get the output the binary. Fortunately, those two are written in Go, so it is possible, right? For th things that are not written in Go, it's probably harder. And then we had some of our own daemon set because we have some daemon sets. And for those ones, uh, basically we did adapt also, uh, also the Docker file, but we were already using a centralized uh, CI script that helped us basically to minimize the cost of the migration, of this migration, of this movement towards uh, multi-architecture build. You can think about it about a reusable GitHub action, right? And we just added support. This reusable GitHub action just detects whether there is or not the use of the argument target platform. If we have the argument target platform, then use multi-architecture. If not, don't use a multi-architecture. And that's it. We just had to do those two, three things in our own code base, and we had support. Were there other lessons that you learned from this migration? The first thing. Uh, that that we realized uh, and that we learned is that at the beginning when we started developing the webhook, the webhook started to deny, right? For reasons, because there was a bug or whatsoever. But we had the webhook in a mode that uh, ignores failures. Yet the pod couldn't enter uh, the cluster, right? This created us an incident. So what we learned is basically that the failure policy, it's only if the webhook is not available but if the webhook says something in Kubernetes, if the mutating or validating webhook says something, it will be applied, even if it's denied. That's one of the um, that's one of the, the the big failure that we had. 
together with um, with some rate limiting and and latency problems uh, from uh, from our email from our uh, Docker registries. So no way is actually clever and doesn't pull the whole image because of course this would be uh, gigabytes of data. So we're not doing that. We're inspecting the manifests uh, directly uh, in Noe, so that's smaller data. But yet, sometimes the latency is a bit high, and we have uh, rate limits on uh, the registries, like Docker or uh, our own internal registries. And from time to time, we have dedosed our uh, our registries, right? So for this, we have implemented a catchy. What we also learned is that sometimes the webhook can be done, right? Can be done because it has a, it had have had a problem, and this means that an image could be scheduled on a node that doesn't that doesn't match, or it can be done because it's not yet deployed, right? So in the concept in the context of a cluster bootstrap, because all of our tooling actually relies on this, we had pods scheduled on the wrong node. For this, what we implemented is a mechanism that on the first startup we will list all the pods and checks, check whether it's scheduled on the relevant node. Here, we faced again the DDoS problem to the registry or the rate limiting to the registry because all the pods that were actually running were uh, pooling and trying to get the image manifest, right? We DDoSed our registry again, so twice. What we learned from this is that, yes, when you write a webhook, don't expect that everything will enter the webhook until you force, un unless you force it, and even. Don't expect that everything will be applied with your webhook. Check it uh, afterwards, and when you start, and apply and delete or apply your webhook on the resources uh, that were there before, that were injected, created, updated when the, the, the hook was not there. And the teams, how do the teams, you know, cope with this migration? Uh, you know, one thing can be the infrastructure, but I'd imagine that some applications needed, you know, tweaks, adjustments um, to run on a different instruction set. So here we are lucky as well, because one of the main philosophies that we have uh, inside the tech organization in Avinta is you build it, you run it. So the teams are owning uh, these, the, the requirements for their execution, and they are owning to adjust the applications. The, the way we, des we designed the migration plan for this was to enable these teams. So it's basically that these teams select when they want to do it. We announce them, we tell them, we offer them help, we, we provide support to all these teams and we can work with them if there's something to adjust but they choose when they are ready and when they have uh, something to test. Uh, so, so when they have something to tweak. And then we provide testing facilities so they can test beforehand and uh, ensure that there's no problems. The other thing is that um, we have a lot of workloads that are on uh, written in Go. And Go is uh, mostly uh, running equally well in AMD and ARM. There were some problems with cryptography in the past, like Tibo was saying, but nowadays it's working seamlessly, more or less the same. Uh, and we are also have a lot of Java. And uh, once you have built with the proper version of the Java runtime, it's not uh, a big issue to, to migrate the workloads. So far, we haven't faced a lot of issues. If you are using other languages and other runtimes, you may have to, to work with support. It depends on the maturity of the ecosystem. Uh, luckily, we didn't have to deal with, with that part a lot. Good. So you said not too many issues, but I want to know, you know, was this migration successful? What's the feedback, you know, from the business, from the end users? Uh, what, would you, what, would you, what would you have to say about that? You know, a lot of work went into this. What's been the reaction? So before then, uh, we had uh, several people are asking for ARM, right? Because uh, Miguel mentioned you build it, you run it, but we added one, which is you pay for it, right? So we are not accountable uh, for the cost of your services, right? So for the cost efficiency, because it's it's not only the code, the pure cost, it's the cost efficiency that we're interested in, right? The developers, they are accountable for the cost efficiency of the services. 
what does this mean? This means that they have interest in going for ARM uh, when uh, when they can, right? Because then they reduce the cost of the services because of how we expose the costs, basically. That means that, yes, we had people asking uh, for this, right? We managed basically uh, to prioritize it because we had this portal, this this team that was uh, that gave us some some lesson learned about um, migrating to ARM. They were also running on Kubernetes, and we were also thinking together with them that it would make sense to converge our uh, Kubernetes clusters, right? So. We prioritized this project because of this, mostly because of this, and some customers that were actually willing to uh, to use ARM. So business was uh, actually, for them, for, for this other team, business was pushing for uh, migrating to ARM, right? So business was happy because they saved costs on their side, right? For the rest of the business that is running on EMD that has some other priorities because they need more speed to develop new features, whatever, they were so happy because it didn't change anything for them. They could keep business as usual, they could focus on their features, and we didn't disturb them a lot at all, right? Not even a lot at all. Well, apart from when we had those incidents that uh, that we were mentioning, right? So sometimes things can fail, and, and it happened, right? Obviously it happened. Uh, so when this happened, this is the time where uh, we actually had some uh, negative feedback from our users. But since then, since we introduced the feature, we have very little bad feedback that is that is uh, reported. And I would say, is it successful? Well, when we introduced the feature, uh, we had less than 2 or 3% of the nodes that were actually ARM. Now... Which uh, so we introduced the feature for our users in uh, in June, right? And now we are at twenty percent of the nodes that have AR, right? So that's a huge increase. Onboarding this uh, the, those teams that we were mentioning helped us, right? We also support the legacy uh, or the AMD, uh, let's say. Um, uh, architecture, so that means that we have we are backward compatible because we absorb the toil, the most of the, the, the most we can, right? This is our this is one of our goal, right? To absorb the toil. That's what makes the business happy, as well. And like you said, with with any migration, you know, we can think about it almost like an SLA. There's going to be some things that are not going to work. It just you know giving enough, you know, ahead of time saying. You know, there are going to be some bumps in the road. Of course, there are. Um, but the the planning, the dry runs that you mentioned previously as well. Too, I think this is all very good insights for teams that might be out there thinking about, you know, going through a similar process and understanding, you know, that this can be done, and and you know the transparency and communication with the different the different stakeholders about what they can expect, um, in order for there not to be any crazy expectations or, or disappointment. In in hindsight, would you do anything differently if you had to go back and do it all over again? Well, probably when we enabled it, right, between, between the last dry run that we did and the, the time that we enabled it, uh, we there was some new bots that I think that there, there was some invalid uh, fi- uh, invalid uh, results that were re- that were reported, right? So we had some multi-architecture manifests, but with no valid uh, architecture in it, right? So probably we should have detected that uh, that before, right? So going with the with the dry run uh, more and this also means that probably we should have a go uh, a bit slower in how we enable it by probably denying those pods uh, at first right so ensuring that all the pods that were uh, that enters the cluster complies with what we need right complies with the interface that we need and we are able to detect an architecture so we deny and then we are clear on the interface. If you don't do anything, this will break. So we deny you, right? Because we know that this will break. Uh, that that's something that um, that we would uh, we would have done uh, differently. I think. Miguel, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I think um, another thing that we didn't do is uh, take a good look at the registries, at the Docker image registries that we depend on. 
And this is something that we found later when we started DDoSing them and with the latency. And we were we could have used a bit more time to make sure that uh, instead of getting them for granted, we we were assumed that they are Docker registered, they are there, and they are going to work. And they they needed we needed to be a bit more uh, careful with them at the beginning. Now, in the beginning, we talked about you know the non technical side of of a career in tech. You know, getting a migration like this moving requires a lot of conversations and convincing, making sure that people, you know, understand how these things are going to work. How do you convince the teams, you know, and internally in the business to migrate to Graviton instances? What was that like? You know, the, the powers of persuasion, um, showing people a brighter future. What was your strategy there? So we, um, we had already demand for this. And we were lucky that other parts of the organization had already done, that were not running on, on ship, uh, had already done the, the business case for themselves to migrate to ARM. So we had a solid foundation that this feature was uh, desired and was useful. Uh, so when we implemented it, we, we reached out to the people who had requested it first to be early adopters. And then uh, we can use their their own savings as they are as own as the developers own their own budget, uh, and they have to de demonstrate the, the cost efficiency of their workloads. Uh, we can use those early adopters as business case to show other people, hey, you need to shave your costs by this much. Look, these people already did, and they did it like that, and it was just a. Uh, an annotation in a namespace. So yeah, if you want those savings, just put the annotation in the namespace. Let's do a dry run. Let's do a try. If you have problems, reach out to me. We uh, we need to do a bit more of evangelism internally for this, because the approach of of just enabling them, uh, of removing all the barriers for adoption means that the people that are not using it is the people that have not realized how useful it is to them. Or maybe it's not never going to be useful to them. So then they are not prospective users and we don't need to migrate them. Yeah, there's people, there's workloads that uh, work fine in AMD and maybe they cannot be migrated to ARM. Maybe they are legacy applications that have no development anymore and migrating them doesn't make any sense. Okay, that's fine. It, it's, it's the team's trade-off the team's decision, uh, if they need to save costs or they need to maintain stability or not touch that piece of code that is working right now. And that's, that's the beauty of this approach for us because we don't have to make those calls. They make the, their calls and we just help them uh, to, to find all the options and all the tools they, at their disposal, putting all the tools at their disposal for solving this. Wow, fantastic. Like you said, the, the combination of there was demand for it, um, you know, and then there are, some, like you said, there are going to be some cases where it's out of sight, out of mind, not relevant. So don't have to convince those folks. Others, we, we say, you know, the expression, don't knock it until you've tried it. We say, look, if you don't like it, that's okay, but just try it. And then, and then you know, the feedback there is very valuable. But I understand the case that, that, like I said, I think it's beneficial for folks out there that might be in a similar situation of understanding how do you build, you know, a coalition of, of, of people that would be enthusiastic about this and, and be willing participants? Anything you want to add there, Tybalt, in terms of learnings on the human side? Well, I think most most have been said, right? So they are our users, they are interested uh, also by the framework that the company is uh, is giving them, right? It's not uh, the, the classic legacy uh, the developers write their code and then they ship it over the the world to the uh, to the SRE team that will run it in production. Right? You build it, you run it, and you pay for it. So that means that uh, the the framework that the company provides already gives incentive for our users to take a look at this. Right? To um, to say, okay, how can I be more efficient in the way uh, cost efficient in in the way I develop? Right? And this also pushes and this removes us this burden of chasing our users and say, hey, did you take a look at, and as Miguel mentioned, right? So in a company, there are a lot of 
times where you have a legacy application or something that you still maintain, but you know you you go for uh, the lowest uh, in uh, the lowest um, uh, the lowest cost possible, right? So low cost maintenance because you know that uh, you're already building the next thing, right? So as a platform team, we should help the company to build the future and not uh, push burden on the company to actually uh, maintain and, and, and increase the cost of maintaining the past, right? We should take a look at the future. And I think that this is what we did uh, with, uh, with, uh, with this migration or this support for ARM because we name it support for ARM. Really solid advice there. And I and I really like the point. I think it's applicable to all companies about creating a culture of responsibility. And you know, you build it, you know, the, you know, the the ownership aspect. And so that people will really have more of an attachment to something and not just, oh, it's going to be somebody else's problem. And and I've I say that because I've seen it directly in organizations and watching friction build with teams because of this idea of well, it's not my responsibility, it's gonna be, it's gonna be your problem. And that does not, it's not very conducive for an environment if you want people to really be participating in willingly and, and collaborating and, and, and something based more on empathy. Now we did talk about, so changing, shifting, shifting gears to things that aren't so technical, but are technical in a way. We did talk about images, but I understand Tibble, you're into photography. Tell us about that. I am. Well, when I have some free time and with uh, Kubernetes and the seven years, uh, seven month old uh, daughter is uh, it's uh, it's a bit uh, hard to find time for that um yes i do uh, i went for different stages in photography from concert uh, to uh, street photography lately um and studio and, and all of this hard to have time to uh, to do it my favorite subject right now is uh, basically my uh, seven month daughter <laughs> But that's a beautiful thing to say, and it's, I think that's, that's nice. And obviously, plenty of opportunities to take pictures of uh, of you know growing up. Just a quick question: analog, digital, both? Yeah, I'm mostly on on digital, uh, although I have plenty of analog cameras. And I started with analog when I was probably twelve years ago, twelve years old, right? So, uh, quite a long time in photography in the end. But now, yes, mostly uh, mostly digital. Okay. Cool. Very, very good. And Miguel, I've heard you're into Taekwondo. Tell us about that. So, well, I, I practiced Taekwondo a long time ago. I uh, started uh, in my teens and uh, spent uh, eight, 10 years uh, practicing and uh, helping around. So I'm... Uh, I'm, I think I'm still valid. Uh, my, my title is still valid as, as a referee for Taekwondo <laughs> competitions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I have been out of practice uh, in the last few years. When when I started joining the tech uh, industry, uh, it was much harder to uh, attend. And once you once you get on calls, uh, they can be disruptive. <laughs> Almost any any commitment you may have, um, getting involved doesn't help either, uh, or moving around a lot. So, so yeah, that's something that is currently my past. Now I've changed my uh, mock fighting uh, with people into mock fighting with characters. And I'm usually with tabletop RPGs. Uh, and actually in Adepinta, we found some people and we made a, a small group and we meet to play tabletop RPGs and, and have all these challenges uh, in a bit less um, less complicated <laughs> fashion. Now, but there are, there are lots of things we can extract from this that are very applicable to to your experience with the migration. Is that so? A couple of things. What's it like being a referee? I mean, I I don't think I've ever spoken to someone who's better. It's really hard because, it just like with a lot of things, is that you have a lot of emotions in your hands because you've got disappointment, you've got expectations, you have family members that might be in the audience that are going to be very upset with the decision. How do you handle that pressure? Uh, it's hard. It's hard. You you handle it by having a good team. So uh, no referee or almost no referee is alone. And especially in Daekwondo, uh, the referee is not alone. There's uh, six to 10 people in, in a mat 
acting as referees at different levels. So uh, you have your team, uh, you have the trust in your team, and then you work with them into making sure that the decision, the, the, the referee that takes the decision can consult everyone. So you get the you get the trust of the people that they are going to tell you the whatever you're missing, and and that once you make the decision, well you have to live with that. And there's people that will get upset, but they they will get upset no matter what you rule. Uh, and um, it's it's it becomes a bit zen in the end. Like yeah, that's how it is. I did my best, and I can I cannot go better. I love that though. And I think, like I said, it's completely applicable to what we were speaking about. And similarly, in your case, what I, I think, you know, with photography, because I'm, uh, you know, into, I make videos and things like that, but, you know, not at a very sophisticated level. But what a lot of people don't understand is that now also, I think with, you know, technology and phones, it makes it really easy to take pretty decent pictures. And so it, it sort of seems that, you know, you don't necessarily need a good camera. But in order to take a good picture with a good camera, there's a lot of time spent on on calibrating, on making sure, you know, that if we're talking about aperture, if we're talking about, you know, the shutter speed, all those different things that go into getting a good picture. There's a lot of prep work. And we get into things, you know, the dry runs to make sure that all these things are going to go right. There's a, a ton of stuff that goes into that. Do you think there's any connection with how that's helped you approach your job in getting the right balance of factors for something like this migration to move forward? I don't know if I would uh, relate anything, uh, right? What I know is that uh, basically probably my Instagram is about uh, a few hundred pictures and I have uh, twenty to uh, 200,000 pictures uh, on my laptop, right? So on, on a hard drive. So that means a lot of trials and error. Yes, uh, a lot of them. You mentioned, yeah, the settings. The settings is probably 1% of the picture. Right, ninety percent or ninety nine percent. I like to to say ninety nine percent because it's a bigger number. Um, but ninety ninety nine percent of the picture is actually how you look at the scene, how you evaluate basically um, how things are going, what what's happening, what what is the landscape that you have, and then you think, okay, so with this background, if I move there, uh, how with how will this look like? Maybe I need to go closer. Maybe I need to go farer because I pr the, the 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 perspective that I will get is uh, is a bit different, I, and I need to wait uh, to have somebody entering in that in that specific combination that makes uh, the picture right. In reality, this is the hard time of photography. This the the shutter speed and what's on. I don't care. Like a, a phone can can do it very good, and and you have a lot of very good photographers uh, that actually use his phones nowadays, right? Because this is technology. This this is not very uh, interesting, right? The the interesting part, if you get into photography, uh, is actually this: how you place, how you how you evaluate the landscape and. And this is something that you cannot replace with with phones. Uh, maybe a bit with AI, uh, we can uh, we can uh, argue this, right? But this is the this is the, the line of thought that, that I have, and uh, I could quote some uh, some some friends of mine uh, that are actually running uh, some workshop in photography, um, and they are actually in the same line of thought, right? So most of the the picture is actually how you look at it, and if you think about it. 50 years ago, uh, when we only had film cameras uh, and, and we have people like Cartier-Bresson that was actually uh, photographing, they didn't have super high tech. And actually, their images are not often that sharp, right? Because this is not, this is not what photography is, right? It, photography is more about composition, about uh, the light, understanding the light. Right and 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 how the light is going to behave and uh, how things are going to echo to each other depending on the composition that you take. Probably it relates a tiny bit, right, with uh, with this uh, orchestrating the ship product in some uh, in some cases. Yeah, no, no, I have a wonderful answer. And for me, I asked about the settings. Uh, asked about that just because for me it's completely overwhelming. But it's really refreshing to know that ninety nine percent of that is not related to that. But I, I understand that. You know, the framing, like you said, the composition, how the light's going to be interacting with the elements that are there. 
Um, good. Last question that I do have, though, uh, Miguel, since you mentioned, you know, tabletop role playing games, a lot of stuff about that in terms of building coalitions, in terms of thinking about next steps, all the stuff that goes into that. Also, handle you know, conflict resolution. What uh, tabletop role playing games are you playing? Uh, so right now, right now, I, we are playing Warhammer Fantasy. So we are playing one of the classic campaigns of the role find the final uh, role Warhammer Fantasy role playing game. Uh, I think it's from the nineties. Uh, it's a bit dated uh, in some parts, uh, but we we kind of go from game to game, trying different systems and playing around. We, we are doing it for fun, and instead of of getting into just one game. Uh, we, we we try to get a, a good view overview of of what has been this history of t- tabletop playing role playing games. Very cool. I must say, like I, I asked about this, you know, when we were getting ready to to do the podcast recording, is that I in the last five years I would say I've got into Warhammer 40k, but not so much playing the game. It's mostly just the lore that surrounds it, and I find it incredible the amount of uh, storytelling that's gone into it and, and building characters in these different scenarios. And while, of course, it's fantasy, there's so much of it that relates to to conflict resolution, all all kinds of different things that we see in modern life. So I find it very relevant and very helpful. Um, so that's great to know. Now, if people want to get in touch with either one of you, what's the best way to do so? Well, if someone wants to reach me, the, I'm on LinkedIn. And uh, also uh, my GitHub account has my public email. So just ping me uh, email or by LinkedIn. Good. Tibble? Well, I'm on most of the social networks, I would say. Uh, so LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, X, and uh, Instagram, right? So those are the those are the mediums that I mostly uh, consult. Uh, maybe not every day, but very often. Often enough that the folks want to get in touch with you. I want to know as well, too, you know, what was the what was the reaction to the to the blog post? And based on that, uh, will we expect future blog posts? What's next for the two of you? I think the blog post has made uh, has been quite popular. Uh, we've also had other blog posts uh, that have had high impact uh, near it. So the metrics are a bit murky, <laughs> but uh, I've I've heard from from our branding team that uh, the blog post has made uh, huge strides uh, since since the summer this year, and uh, ha- it, it's very popular right now. And a blog post is one of the uh, and the top five of the most popular ones uh, in the tech blog uh, in the tech blog, and uh, I I don't know if we will get more blog posts for Noe, uh, but uh, there's gonna be more things in shape for sure. And we have committed, uh, we have an internal commitment to disseminate what the work we do and, and show it. Because uh, you go to conferences and you see people speaking. And uh, with with people that have been like Tibo for a long time in the team, it's like okay, yes, we do that, and we do that, and we do that. So why the hell are, are we not there speaking about what we do? So we are trying to change that and, and trying to speak a, a lot more about the the work that happens in the team. And uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Tanat Loke uh, Sharon Lab, I think I butchered his name. Sorry, <laughs> he's uh, he's from Thailand. I'm I'm not really sure how it's pronounced, uh, but he has a bunch of blog posts also in the Devinta Tech blog, and he is starting to to do some talks as well in in public spaces about about the work that we do in Ship. And he's he's working a lot as an ambassador for for the team right now. Tibble, anything you want to add to that? Well, most of the most of of this was uh, was said, right? So. Of course, we will keep uh, writing blog posts. Maybe not directly me. Uh, I would love to to have time and to to explain more uh, what we are doing and where we are heading at because we have uh, we have plans about it. Uh, the team is growing. Uh, we are actually uh, doubling, almost doubling the the size of the team uh, if we compare if we take into action everybody that uh, that will contribute to what ship is today. Uh, so that means a, a lot of challenges, right? So a lot of a uh, lot of new members that come from with with different uh, landscape and this would be fascinating uh, to uh, to basically learn also from them right it's it's not only uh, what we have at the moment and the direction that we are taking at the moment uh, that is important but more uh, learning from everybody that that will be in this team uh, and in this group of team because 
uh, it will be a group of team. This will be interesting, and hopefully we can we can write uh, blog posts about it. Um, not only Tanat, right? Tanat is a, is a great uh, writer, uh, and and I would definitely encourage uh, reading uh, his blog posts about our failures because most of the blog posts are about our failures in ship. But also Joao, our manager, is also writing a lot about uh, about his uh, his approach to management on to on X uh, X Twitter. And this is also uh, pretty interesting to uh, to read. So, yes, we are in the process of sharing more what we what we do, um, and and hopefully we can make it to uh, to conferences and uh, basically stop thinking that uh, we're doing we're not doing that great, right? Because uh, what we see today is that we are doing great, and that we need to uh, to make it more known, right? Couldn't agree more. And from listening to your experience and, and reading the blog post as well, it's abundantly clear that you are doing fantastic things. Tons of know-how and experience going into this. And I think it's going to be very beneficial for other for other uh, individuals as well as organizations to hear about your experience. That being said, I hope our paths cross either at KubeCon in Paris or somewhere, some event in Barcelona. Hope to be out there for, for our CNCF meetups as well too. Keep sharing your knowledge. Thank you for your hard work and dedication. And we'll be speaking soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.